This is a PowerPoint slideshow called The Shearables, the Hackables, and the Untouchables. It is part of what will be 14 classes for the Master Pruner Seminar Series given by me, Cass Turnbull, for the organization Plant Amnesty, which is an organization to promote better pruning. This is advanced pruning, and you should already know regular pruning before you endeavor to understand these exceptions to the rules. I'm going to start out with uh, basic pruning, and if you already know basic pruning, you can switch to Chapter 2, The Shearables. But let's start at the beginning to catch people up if they have not already heard the basics to pruning. There are only three basic cuts in pruning, and if people understood the cuts, they would understand most of pruning just by knowing what was going to happen next. On the top, you have the non-selective heading cut. That's where you just basically whack something back to no place in particular. And uh, this kind of a cut gets people into trouble when they're trying to reduce the size of their plants or make them a certain shape. Because rather than telling a plant to stop growing at the site of the cut, it actually stimulates regrowth, right? Just below the cut, a bunch of sprouts grow out rapidly. Those are called water sprouts, and you can see them on the right-hand side. Water sprouts are the straight, skinny, rapidly growing shoots which are a direct result of malpruning. In general, you want to avoid the non-selective heading cut. The cut just below that, called the selective heading cut, or sometimes we call it the reduction cut, is the right way to shorten a branch. You locate the part that sticks out or up the most, you follow it back to a naturally occurring fork, and you cut it off there. If that side branch is big enough, the new growth gets forced through it in the future, and you don't get water sprouts. Your branch is briefly shorter. Uh, it looks good. doesn't matter when you prune. You'll still have flowers, and life is good. The selective heading or reduction cut. The third kind of a cut is called a thinning or a removal cut. You know, they had to change the names of all the cuts, just like they have to change the names of everything. I don't know what they're thinking. Anyway, the thinning or removal cut takes off the smaller of the two forks. It takes off a side branch. You can see this on the lower portion of the slide. And we're going to black it out so you can see which one we're talking about. And if you cut that branch off and it's not too big and there are not too many of them in your tree or shrub, then you won't get water sprout regrowth. The new growth will be forced through existing branches and uh, this is what we do, like taking off the lower limbs of a tree or thinning out a shrub to make it open, airy, and delicate. This cut never made anything shorter, but it is the best cut for the health of the plant. And all things being equal, gardeners and arborists would prefer the thinning cut. You use the selective heading and the thinning cut uh, evenly throughout your shrub or your tree in order to get what you want, uh, plants don't need to be pruned to do their best work, but uh, usually we're trying to get something we want that we don't already have, usually to fix the ill effects of overplanting. But if people just had the right picture in their head of what was going to happen next after they made their cuts, you could probably figure out all pruning on your own. I divided shrubs into three categories, cane growers, tree likes, and mounding habit shrubs as a way to get people to understand how to prune them. And these three types of shrubs and trees are the same throughout the world, just the names of the species change. Plant Amnesty does have some regional guides uh, that divide plants into these subgroups, which are available online at plantamnesty.org. But you should get so that you can just read the habit of your shrub and know how to prune it by looking at it. Mounding habit shrubs. This is the first category of plants. These are the blobs of the plant world. They have either small leaves or supple branches. Uh, they're kind of wider than they are tall. They're sort of the blobs of the plant world or the chorus line. Uh, and you don't want to spend all day in there making them into artwork. You just want to tidy them up and make them a little bit shorter and maybe get them off the walkway. They do come in various sizes, small, medium, and large. 
This slide shows the proper way to make your shrub shorter. You don't just clip it into a ball or a box. You use the selective pruning technique. If you find the branch that bugs you the most, that sticks out too far or is crowding the center, and you grab it with your left hand, you follow it down inside the plant. You can follow any of these uh, blacked out branches to where it meets up with a side branch or sometimes the ground, and you cut it off there. Then you blur your eyes and look over the shrub and look for the next worst one that hits the house, runs into the shrub next to it, or just plain bugs you, and you follow it down inside the plant and cut it off where it meets up with something. And that way you can make your mounting habit shrub that is four feet to an, into a mounting habit shrub which is three feet tall, and it's tidy and it will still bloom no matter when you prune it, and life is good. Cane growers are the second category of shrub, and these are plants that renew themselves with branches that we call canes that arise directly from the ground. These are really tough plants. There's nothing that you can do to them that we can't get them back. The main thing is to avoid clipping them into a ball or a box or just non-selectively heading them all over. Mainly when you're pruning these sorts of shrubs, you cut entire canes to the ground or sometimes an inch or two above the ground using a handsaw or a lopper or sometimes a hand pruner. Generally speaking, if you're trying to make it shorter, you take out, oh, say an eighth of the biggest, tallest canes every year and let new ones grow up to be replacement canes. If you do that every year, your shrub is never older than eight years old. But you also take out canes to open up the center. You take out crossing rubbing branches. You take out uh, canes that are actually touching the ground and you can make your cane grower less bulky, more open and airy, and just generally more lovable. That's it for cane growers. Oh, I should mention that with the mounding habit shrubs and the cane growers, you can reduce their size by about a quarter, and you can take off about a third of the foliage before you get into trouble. And what do I mean by trouble? I mean water sprouts. Plants have a pruning budget, and if you exceed the budget, you get water sprouts, or sometimes they look bad, uh, or sometimes they get sick. And we don't want sick shrubs because they are not attractive shrubs. So the bottom line to pruning is you can do whatever you want to your shrub as long as you maintain the long-term health and beauty. So that's it for cane growers. The third category is trees and tree-like shrubs. And these plants are sort of the Cadillacs of the garden. They are a higher class of plant. We kind of know that a homomalous beats a forsythia, a witch hazel beats a forsythia, even though they both have nice yellow flowers. And that's because a witch hazel has a beautiful branch structure. And that structure is woody and stiff, and it divides many times. It divides and divides into smaller and finer and smaller and finer twigs. This is the part that makes you realize, even on a subconscious level, that these are the better quality shrubs of the garden. And you do not want to prune them heavy-handedly, and you want to stay away from heading cuts, both selective and non-selective. You want to use mainly true thinning cuts to open them up or take off the lower branches. Why? Because if you use selective heading and even non-selective heading, you'll get a nightmare of water sprouts that you cannot get rid of by repruning, and you can mess them up for a long, long time. Here's an example of a tree. It's a weeping tree. It's a weeping willow. There are three arborists in it, and this is what it looks like before it gets thinned out with thinning cuts or removal cuts, as they're called. This is the after picture. See how clean and crisp it looks? There's one guy way out to the left who's just finishing off that section, and it will match the rest. You take off both large cuts and small cuts evenly throughout the crown. You don't prune just the tips. You don't prune just the inside. You take some and you leave some all the way throughout the crown of the tree or shrub. Let me do the before again. This is the before. This is the after. See how much nicer it looks? I have a whole slideshow on why not to do certain things to shrubs and trees. 
You should never, ever, ever top a tree or strip it out. Uh, and you should not be shearing things into globes, cubes, nose cones, hockey pucks, and kettle drums. This is considered the hallmark of bad taste in gardening is shearing things. It's a whole series of non-selective heading cuts. It's bad for the health of the plant. And it creates a maintenance nightmare for the owner. Board grounds crews get into shearing a lot. Um, and whoever your immigrant population, anybody who's entry level into the garden business just does what everybody else does. And they migrate towards those power head shears, which should have a warning label on them. Uh, just so you know, shearing is okay for hedges and topiary, not okay for most plants in your garden. Just because it's sheared doesn't mean it's topiary. So there are a lot of problems with shearing. It's not just a matter of bad taste, which it is, but it's also bad for the health of plant. You can actually destroy a garden by shearing everything in it for 20 years. One of the problems with shearing things for yard control is that it's high maintenance. You create these water sprout nightmares that you constantly have to keep shearing off and shearing off, and that just creates more and more and more. It is also becomes difficult to reduce the size of your plant, not your plan, but your plant. You create a twiggy outer shell where you have sheared it, and that gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year, and you can't ever go beyond that shell because you just have a bunch of dead plants, uh, dead branches on the inside. You can also increase freeze, drought, and insect damage. If you're a bug, the perfect place to live is inside a sheared shrub where uh, the air circulation, the sun, and the insect sprays can't find you. It also forces soft growth, which is more prone to freeze and drought, and it's just generally a stress on the health of these plants creating dead wood and water sprouts, and it looks pretty bad. It also destroys the part of your plant that was chosen. Everything in your garden was chosen because it does something special. It has a nice quilted leaf or a little fine texture, or an architectural effect. And when you shear things, they just all start looking the same. The beauty of a garden is often created by creating contrast between textures, shapes, and sizes of plants. And when you shear things, they all start to look the same. For example, we call this one, Welcome to Tombstone. <laughs> 